We are thankful that we have freedom in Christ. We are thankful that he's freed us from our sins. We are thankful that we can be here this morning no matter what anyone else is doing this morning. No matter where they are, we are here to worship. And God is here with us. Doesn't get any better than that. Scripture reading this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet who wrote 700, 800 years before Christ. And he was a prophet to the nation of Israel, to the southern kingdom of Judah. And he wrote at a time when the nation was enjoying great prosperity. They were doing well. There was success. There was peace. There was wealth. The economy was good. But the people weren't doing very well. Most of them had abandoned the worship of the one true God in order to worship gods of their own making. Gods of gold and silver. And those who didn't worship idols, they worshiped God out of habit, out of ritual, instead of out of a relationship with Him. Isaiah chapter 46, God speaks through the prophet Isaiah and he reminds the people that these gods of gold and silver have been crafted by men. And after they have finished making them, they carry them to wherever they want to worship them. What kind of a god is it that you have to carry around in a cart? Is that who they're counting on to save them? Is that who they're counting on to help them? Isaiah reminds the people to think back. He tells them to remember their history, remember their past. Remember, he says, how God has helped him. How he brought them into the land that he promised them. How he's protected them from their enemies. When they've sinned, it's been God who has gone after them and brought them back to himself and forgiven them. He truly is a God who has carried them. Isaiah reminds the people that God has been faithful. He has been faithful to his word. What he says he will do, he has done. That's what makes him God. He's got the power to do it. He speaks, it happens. When he speaks about the future, it's done. He may use... People, he might use nature, he might use circumstances. We might not even see God work, but be sure of this. He will work to bring about all that he has said in his word. He will bring it all to pass. Isaiah, chapter 46, beginning at verse 9, God says this. Remember the former things long past. For I am God and there is no other. I am God. And there is no one like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly, I have spoken. Truly, I will bring it to pass. I have planned it, surely, I will do it. Lord God, we take you at your word. You are a God that we can trust. And we put our trust in you, Lord God, this morning, that you are here with us and that you will speak to us and you will give us what we need in order to worship you, in order to magnify you. That is what we want to do this morning, Lord. We want to worship you. Please help us to do that. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to be still before you and know that you truly are God and there is none like you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. The earthly ministry of Jesus took him from his hometown in Nazareth into the area of Galilee, into Samaria, into Judea, all the way into the heart of the Jewish nation, all the way into the city of Jerusalem. And as it does today, his message divided the people. There were those who believed him, 
There were those who followed him. There were those who didn't believe him. And then there were those who hated him and wanted to discredit him and even wanted to kill him. But of all those who hated Jesus, there, there is none who hated him more than the religious leaders of the Jewish nation. They wanted him out of the way, and we can understand why. He exposed their hypocrisy. He exposed their lies. He called it like it was. He saw their sin. He saw their hearts were far from God, and he publicly told them so. About eight months before Jesus would allow himself to be taken and to be crucified, he was preaching in the city of Jerusalem. And the chief priests and the Pharisees sent the highly trained Levite temple guards in order to take him. These men, these guards, were not only soldiers, but they were educated in the laws, in the ways of the Jewish nation. And though they had been sent to take Jesus by force if necessary, when they found him, they became part of the audience that was listening to him speak. They stood there and they listened to Jesus preach. And when they returned to the temple, the leaders asked them, why didn't you bring him? They said this in John 4, 46, never did a man speak the way that this man speaks. The power of the words of Christ overwhelmed them. These were professionals, professional soldiers, but they couldn't even do their job. They were so overwhelmed by the words of Christ. No one who has ever lived has spoken the way that Jesus speaks. God himself, the creator of the universe, standing face to face with his creation and speaking to them. He is the greatest preacher who's ever lived. But besides him, who's the greatest preacher? Someone from the past? Maybe someone out of the Bible? Someone who lives today? Well, it has been said that the most dynamic, the greatest preacher, the one with the most power, is not even a person. It has been said that the greatest preacher is in fact death. Death cuts across nations and races, religion. It speaks all languages. Death doesn't differentiate between rich and poor, young and old. As we mourn for someone who we've lost, at that moment, nothing else matters. Death has our full attention. Even just the thought of the death of someone that we love can bring tears to our eyes. That's powerful preaching. As we've looked at the first nine chapters of the book of Revelation, we have seen death. We've seen wars, we've seen famines, we've seen disease. Hailstorms and fire and, and earthquakes. We've seen the water contaminated. The air polluted. We've seen the land devastated. We've seen demons released. And they have caused suffering. And they have caused death. And we've watched all of this for nine chapters. But what is amazing, and what is hard to understand, is that after all of this suffering, after all of this death, after death has spoken so loudly to these people, we find at the end of Revelation chapter 9, verse 21, it says the people still did not repent. They will refuse to call out to God. They'll refuse to ask Christ for forgiveness. There is forgiveness available. It's there. But they'll refuse to believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. That his blood alone will pay for their sins. The end of chapter 9. It seems that for many of these people, they have reached a point of no return. That can happen. Proverbs 29.1 says this, A man who hardens his neck 
after much reproof will suddenly be broken and that without remedy. By the end of Revelation chapter 9, many of these people have hardened their hearts. They have set themselves against God. For them, it seems, there is no turning back. And so an angel is sent from heaven in Revelation chapter 10, and he has been given the responsibility to make an announcement. The end is near. The time has come. And so John says this, Revelation chapter 10, verse 1, I saw. He said, I was an eyewitness to another vision. He says, I saw another angel, alos in Greek, another one like one that he had seen before. Which one had he seen? Remember back in Revelation 5, 2, John told us that he saw a strong angel, didn't he? He said it was an an Agalon Escuron, an overpowering angel. And this angel stood and he cried with a loud voice and he asked all of heaven and all of earth and those under the earth, if there is anyone who is worthy, is there anyone who is worthy to take back the earth from the enemy, who has the power, who has the ability, who has the right to do it, who has the right to rule? And there was silence. No one spoke. And we watched with John as Christ stepped forward and he took the scroll, the title deed of the earth, out of the hand of God the Father and he took back the earth. Well, now John sees another angel, another strong angel. But this one is not standing in heaven. This one is not standing before the throne of God. It says here in verse 1, this one is coming down from heaven. He's coming down to earth. And this angel is also a powerful angel. Verse 1 says he's clothed with a cloud. In the Bible, clouds are many times associated with the power of God, the glory of God, His presence, sometimes with judgment. Exodus 13, we are told that God led the children of Israel through the wilderness with a pillar of a cloud. Exodus 33, we're told that Moses went to the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, and a pillar of cloud would descend at the door and he would speak with God and God would speak with him. Daniel 7, Matthew 24, Revelation 1, we're told that our Savior will come with the clouds. This angel comes on a cloud. This angel comes with the power and with the majesty and with the glory of God. And he comes with a message. He's got a message from God. It says in Psalm 104, in speaking of God, he makes the clouds his chariots. This angel is, is coming first class. He's coming with the clouds. And he descends to earth. And when John saw him, he said in verse 1, he had a rainbow on his head. An iris. It's a bright circle. It's a circle that surrounds another object, like the iris in our eye surrounds our pupil. This angel had a circle that looked like a rainbow around his head, like a halo. Despite all of the paintings in all of the museums, despite all of the pictures in the storybooks, despite all of the sculptures that are found in our churches today, this is the only place in the Bible that we are told that anyone has a halo around their head. But we're told there was a halo around the throne of God, right? Revelation 4.3, we were told that it was a rainbow in iris. It surrounded the throne of God. What did that tell us? Remember, what did it tell us? What did it speak of? Well, it spoke of Noah, right? It spoke of the time that God put a rainbow in the sky as a reminder of his faithfulness to his word, a reminder to Noah that he would never again destroy the earth 
With a flood, despite the sinfulness of man, God would prove to be faithful to his word. He is a God of mercy. That's what the rainbow reminds us of. God is a God of mercy. And this strong angel comes with that promise, with the promise of mercy. Promise of mercy to those who will come to Christ. Verse 1, John says his face, too. He says his face was bright. It was shining. It was almost blinding like the light of the sun. It was blinding with the light of the glory of God. And he said his feet were like pillars of fire. He said they were like pillars. They were strong like the pillars in a building. He said, but they were on fire. They were burning. Malachi 4.1 says, Behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace. And all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be chaff, and that day is coming and will set them ablaze. That's how John describes this angel. It's pretty descriptive, isn't it? This angel comes with the glory, with the power, with the majesty of God. He comes with the promise of mercy for those who will come to Christ. But he also comes with the certainty of judgment for those who will reject the offer of salvation. This is quite an angel. And John says, then he notices what this angel has in his hand. Verse 2, he said he had in his hand... A little book, uh, a Bibliodarion, a little scroll. And he said it was a small scroll and it was open. It was lying open in the palm of this angel's hand. It was unrolled. He's got a message from God. This angel is bringing a message from God. And John says when he descended to the earth, he placed his right foot on the sea, he placed his left foot on on the land. The message he brings is for everyone. It's for all mankind. It covers, it spans the globe from sea to sea, from land to sea. It is a message for everyone. The sovereignty, the sovereign authority of God overshadows everyone and everything on earth. God has the final word, not man. Despite what we think, this isn't our world. It's God's world. Psalm 24.1 says, The earth is the Lord and all that contains the world and those who dwell in it. This angel brings a message from God for everyone to hear. So he stands on land and sea. And it's a message, John says, that he is delivering with a roar, it says in verse 3. He cried out like a lion. He says, it was a deafening sound. He says, Amos 3, it says, a lion roared and who will not fear? This is a fearful voice this angel has. He brings a fearful message. And when he cried out, it says in verse 3, in response to this roar, in response to the voice of this angel, John said he heard heaven. He said, he heard heaven rumble like thunder. Verse 3, it says, seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. Heaven speaks. 2 Samuel 22, it says, the Lord thundered from heaven. And the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent arrows out and scattered them and lightning and routed them. The voice of God sounds like thunder, it says. And like Psalm 29, it is the sevenfold power, the completeness, the fullness of the power of God. God speaks. God does have the final word. Even over this angel. God has the final word. He is the final word. In the end, you know, that's all that really is going to matter. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter what their opinions are, their theories. It doesn't matter that they have a TV special. None of that will matter. The only thing that will matter is what God says is true. What he says is true in his word. And then John says, verse 4, when the seven peals of thunder, when God, the voice of God had spoken. He said, I was about to write. 
John's been writing for over nine chapters. God told him to write. Remember Christ said back in Revelation 1.19, he was to write down what he had seen and what he had heard, heard. And John's been faithful to do that. He has written down all of these visions. He's written down everything he's seen, everything that he's heard. And he says, I was at the point of writing again. I was just about to write it down. He says, when there came a voice from heaven, verse 4, and it said, seal it up. Fragizo. Close it. Don't write it down. Don't write down the things with the seven peals of thunder have spoken. He says, don't write them down. Don't even begin to write. Keep these words hidden. John heard, heard God speak. He heard God speak and his voice sounded like thunder. He heard God speak to this angel. And John must have understood what was said because it says he was about to write it down. But it's not for us to hear. It's not for us to know now. It's hard for us to take sometimes, isn't it? There are just things that we don't know, things that we can't know, things that God hasn't revealed to us. That's why people can't understand the Bible. They want to know what everything means. Sometimes we just don't know. And here we're told what was said is not for us to hear. God chooses to reveal to us what he wants us to know why does he do that? He gives us that information so that we will apply it to our lives. He gives us the information so we'll obey what he has given us. Deuteronomy 29, it says this, The secret things belong to God. But the things that are revealed, it says, belong to us and to our sons for all generations. God chooses to give us information, not just to give us information. He gives us information so that it will somehow affect our lives. That it will affect the way that we live. That it will make us different because we understand what he has spoken to us. And there's enough here. There's enough in what he's given us for it to affect our lives. There's enough with what this angel is about to, to say that should affect our lives. This angel has come to make an announcement. The end is near, the time has come. He says, the angel, verse 5, John says, I saw standing on the sea and on the land, lifted up his right hand to heaven. He's about to make an oath before God, a vow. He's about to swear an oath like a witness would swear an oath in a court of law. And he testifies that what he is about to say is true. It's true, but it's not true because of him. It's not true because of who he is. It is true because of the one that he swears by. He says in verse 6, he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heaven and all the things in it, who created the earth and all the things in it, who created the sea and all the things in it. He swears by the creator of the universe. He swears by Christ. Christ is the creator of the universe. Colossians 1.16 says he made it all. And so this angel swears by Christ, by the truth of who Christ is. What does it say in in Revelation 3, verse 14, that Jesus Christ is the faithful and the true witness. He swears by Christ. And so, this angel is about to make a monumental statement. Don't go over it so quickly. Take the time here. Listen to what he says. He says, there shall be delay no longer. Revelation 6.10. Remember the, our brothers and sisters who had been killed during the tribulation? Some of them who had been killed and they were there below the altar, at the foot of the altar. And they cried out to God. And what did they ask God? They said, how long? 
How long before you will avenge our blood? How long will you make things right and judge the earth, judge the people of the earth? How long? When will it happen, God? The answer comes here through this angel. There will, there shall be delay no longer. But when will it take place? The angel's got that information too. It says in verse 7, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel. Well, we've seen six angels sound their trumpets, right? Saw that in chapter 8 and 9. Seventh angel doesn't sound his, his trumpet until chapter 11, verse 15. That's when these days begin. That is when the final series of judgment begin that will be poured out on the earth. There shall be delay. No longer. We're almost there, this angel says. And when he was about to sound, it says. When the seventh angel is about to sound, he tells us this. He says, then the mystery of God is finished. He points us to the exact time and place. It's whatever it is, it's been a mystery. It's been sealed. It's been hidden. But this angel says, when that seventh angel sounds his trumpet, you're going to see it all. The mystery will be revealed. And he said, this is a mystery, verse 7, that uh, God has preached to his, to his prophets, to Moses, to David, to Daniel, to Isaiah, to Jeremiah, to Ezekiel, to all of them. The prophets were given a glimpse of the fullness of the plan of God. But just a glimpse. They were given a glimpse of the kingdom, a glimpse of Christ, the Messiah. These prophets spoke of a day that hadn't yet occurred. They didn't even understand sometimes what they were speaking about and when it would take place. They didn't have the whole story, so it has remained a mystery. But now, we are told, in Christ, it will be revealed. The divine plan of God has been revealed in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1.10 tells us that, doesn't it? It says, Christ is the summing up of all things, of things in the heavens and of the things on earth. When the seventh angel sounds his trumpet, then, it says, the mystery of God is completed. It will be revealed. It says, Christ will be revealed. Christ will be revealed in all of his glory. This information didn't come down to earth to just give us some information about the time of the next series of judgments. We've got that. He didn't need to do that. He's come down for a far more important reason, much more important. This powerful angel has come down. He's sworn an oath before God that he is announcing the coming of Jesus Christ. That's quite an assignment. Revelation 11:15. The seventh angel sounds his trumpet. A series of judgments begin, but when he sounds his, his trumpet, this is what it says, there were voices in heaven. And it said, those voices cried out this, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. This angel is announcing the coming of the king. That's why he's such a special angel. The mystery is revealed. The strong angel announces the return of Christ. Think about those who belong to Christ who are in the middle of the tribulation in that dark time and they're being overwhelmed by all of the evil around them. Think how these words will bring them comfort. Be faithful, brothers and sisters. Be faithful unto death. The king is coming. 
and he's coming soon. Six angels have sounded. One more is about to sound. In verse 4, John heard a voice from heaven. He was told not to write. He was told not to write down what he heard. Now, in verse 8, it says he hears a voice from heaven again. He says, I heard a voice from heaven again speaking to me. And this voice said, go. Go and take the book, which is in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. Well, once again, John is no longer an observer to these visions. He's no longer just an eyewitness, no longer just a reporter. He becomes part of the vision. He becomes part of the action. And so what's his reaction to this? What does he do? What does he do when he hears the voice of God tell him to go and take that book? Does he argue with God? Does he try to figure out uh, maybe there's a way to explain this away? Does he ignore the instructions? He doesn't do any of those things. He gets right to it. Says he. He goes and does it. He's obedient. He does what he's told by God. It may sound unusual, but he does it anyway. It says that, verse 9, he says, I went to the angel. And he said, I, I said to him, give me the little book. Give me the scroll. Verse 9, the angel said, take it. He said, take it and eat it. He said, but he warns John. He says, it'll make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it's going to be sweet like honey. What are we talking about here? We're not talking about eating a scroll, are we? Well, of course not. We're talking about the Word of God, aren't we? Isn't that what we're talking about here? Psalm 119, 103, it says, How sweet are thy words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. We're talking about God's Word. It's the Word of God that nourishes us like food. It's the Word of God that, uh, that nourishes our souls like honey. John is to take the scroll. He's to take it from the hand of this angel. And he is to read it. And he is to take it into his heart. Just like Ezekiel. Remember Ezekiel chapter 3. He was told to eat a scroll also. And it said there he was told to take the words that God had given him, that had spoken, he had spoken to him, to take them into his heart, to digest them, to make them a part of his being. And then God told Ezekiel, you are to go out and you are to speak those words that are in your heart and in your life to my people. That is a lesson for all of us. We can never speak for God. We can never speak for God unless we have His Word in our hearts and in our lives. I don't care what anyone says. If it doesn't come from their heart and it doesn't come from God, the words out of their mouth won't come from Him. So John goes, he takes the scroll, he says in verse 10. He says, I took the little book. He said, I took it out of the angel's hand and I ate it. And he said, the angel was right. In my mouth, it was sweet. The words were sweet. As John feeds on the words, these words, the word of God. He begins to understand what is about to take place. Christ will come. He will come and he will take back the earth. He will come and establish his kingdom forever. Everything will be made right. Evil will be judged. God's people will be vindicated. There will be no more pain or suffering or death. There will be only joy and peace in his presence forever. These are words that are sweet. But they're also words, we are told, that have pain. And bitterness. Verse 10, he said, after I had eaten it, he said, in my stomach, my stomach was made bitter. There's pain. There's the pain of knowing that those who reject Christ will be lost forever. 
The pain of knowing that they will be separated from him. That they will be in torment forever, forever without hope, forever without God. These are painful words. As we've looked at the book of Revelation, we have had the joy and the sweetness of gathering around the throne of God. And we have worshipped and we have praised him. But we have also had the sorrow and the horror as we have seen the bitter reality that those who reject Christ will be separated from him forever. The same word that brings us joy brings us pain. We see those that we love. And as we give them the word of God, we give them the message of salvation. There is hope. There's hope in Christ. And as we watch them reject God's word, there is pain and there's bitterness in our hearts because we, we know that when they reject Christ, they reject an eternity with him. It is a bitter, sweet message that we bring. But we press on, don't we? Just like John was told to press on. It says in verse 11, and they said to me, you must prophesy again. Maybe he thought it was over. Maybe he thought his writing assignment had been finished. God tells him it's not finished. There's more. He says, John, though this is going to be difficult, though what you're about to witness and hear will be difficult, you must continue to write. You must continue to write what is being revealed to you. Why? He says, for the people, verse 11. For those of every race, he says, for the nations, those in every country. He says, those of every language, every tongue. He says, and kings, those in authority, those who lead governments, those the leaders in business, those who have power, those who don't have power. He said, you must testify because of all of these people, because they will read your words and they will know. So you must continue, John. You must continue for their benefit and for our benefit, isn't it? For our benefit too, so we can take these words and we can eat them and we can take them into our heart and we can digest them and then we can live in the light and the knowledge of these words and reach people for Christ because we know what is coming. Isn't that true? So John must continue to be faithful just like we must continue to be faithful until we are finished our assignment and we are taken home to heaven. It's a bittersweet message, isn't it? The gospel is a bittersweet message. Psalm 126, it says, we sow in tears. It says, we go out weeping, carrying our seed. We're crying as we're bringing the message. We know that those who die without Christ have no hope. They have no hope of salvation and they are forever lost. Death brings the end to the hope of salvation unless you have Christ. Death is a powerful preacher, isn't he? Death preaches to us, but we preach to death. 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Death, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? It says the power, the power of of death is the law. And the power of the law is sin. He says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Who gives us the victory over sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. The message that we preach to death is this. I belong to Christ. By the blood of Christ, he has saved me. He has purchased me. You have no power over me anymore. Nothing can separate me from my Savior. Not even you. I am His forever. Lord God, we are yours. 
And we do thank you for the blood of Christ. In the end, that's all that will matter, is that we have you as our savior and you have purchased us. Lord God, you have given us words that I pray we would take into our hearts and that we would digest, that we would think about, and that we would bring to those people who you have for us to reach. John was given an assignment and you have given us an assignment. We are to bring the message with tears, but we are to bring the message. I thank you, Lord, that you have provided the way home, the way to heaven, the freedom that we have, the freedom to worship you, the freedom to know that we are no longer bound by sin or by death. The enemy wants to tell us something different. It's a lie. You have purchased us and you have purchased us with your blood and we thank you, Lord, and as we take the bread, we take the cup, we take it knowing we are yours and we are yours forever. Amen.